In August 2017, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, completed the last of more than 22,000 public engagements. It was 70 years before that, in 1947, that the public first became aware of the dashing young naval officer as his engagement to the young Princess Elizabeth was announced. He was Britain's longest serving royal consort, walking two steps behind the Queen on a relentless round of royal duties. He was president or patron of more than 800 charities and organizations. Six million young people around the world have taken part in the award scheme that bears his name. And on the distant Pacific island of Tanna, Islanders even consider him a god and revere photographs of him. Most of us knew him simply as the husband of the Queen, the father of the heir to the throne, Prince Charles. But the full picture of Prince Philip is more remarkable, much more intriguing and far more surprising. Copenhagen, Denmark. Prince Philip's unexpected march to the heart of the British royal family has its origins here in a surprising twist of fate. In the 19th century, his great-grandfather Christian was an officer in the Danish army. He would have expected his life to be one of military service on a modest income until destiny intervened. In 1863, the King of Denmark died without children, and Christian was chosen as his successor. Frederick VII was childless, and so they were casting around for the most appropriate um, heir. And um, Prince Philip's great-grandfather, Christian, was God's son. He was a sort of distant kinsman of the, of the king, and the choice was, was put on him. His ascent to the Danish throne made his children eligible to marry into other royal families. And they did. Many of today's European monarchs are his direct descendants. But his youngest son, George, Prince Philip's grandfather, reached a European throne, not because of marriage, but because of historic events. On the other side of Europe, Greece fought for and won independence from the Ottoman Empire. After the Greek War of Independence, the so-called protecting powers, um, which were Great Britain, France and Russia, um, stipulated that the future monarch of this independent country could not be from Greece and neither could it could he or she be from one of the protecting powers themselves. So Prince Philip's grandfather, who came from Denmark, he was sort of deemed to be the most neutral candidate, while at the same time having a decent dose of royal European blood. So this Danish prince became King George I of Greece, and his younger son, Prince Andrew, married one of Queen Victoria's great-granddaughters, Princess Alice. In 1921, they were living here on Corfu. In this house, Mon Repos, where Alice became pregnant with her fifth child. Princess Alice, at age 36, went into labor. The local doctor scoured the house and decided the dining room table was the best place for her to give birth. And so Philippos, Schleswig, Holstein, Sunderberg, Glücksburg, a member of both the Greek and Danish royal families, was born in a beautiful house in an idyllic setting. At first glance, he was getting a very good start in life. But danger was just around the corner. Philip's father, 
Prince Andrew was an officer in the Greek army, which at that time was involved in a three-year war against Turkey. And this war culminated in a calamitous retreat. And this resulted in a colonel's coup in Greece, which deposed the monarchy. And a lot of the army officers went on trial, including Prince Philip's father. Prince Andrew was under threat of execution by Greece's revolutionary court. At just 18 months old, baby Philippos was oblivious to the danger his family was in. His family home was under surveillance. His mother, Alice, and his sisters had to burn his father's letters and documents. A lot of his fellow officers were tried and then very soon after executed. And Prince Philip's father might well have joined them had it not been for the intervention of King George V, the Briton, who was his first cousin. So an envoy was sent from Britain and a deal was done whereby Prince Andrew would be put on trial, found guilty, and he was banished for life from Greece. The family were evacuated on a British warship. Baby Philip was carried on board in a wooden fruit box. And so at the age of one and a half, Britain's Royal Navy had entered Philip's life for the very first time. And as he sailed from these waters, the baby prince was suddenly homeless and stateless, a refugee fleeing from the country in which he was born. Displaced and dispossessed, Philip's family were dependent on relatives. In 1923, they moved to France to stay with family in a house near Paris. Philip was sent to the American school. Certainly when he first went to school, he was asked, you know, what he was called, and he, he said, I'm, I'm called Philip. And, and they said, well, you must have another name. You, what do you mean, just Philip? And so eventually he said rather, you know, shyly and reluctantly, well, I, I suppose I, I, I'm Philip of Greece. And of course that was sort of probably met by, you know, a certain amount of amusement as well. His memories of his life in Paris in the 1920s were good ones. It was a normal family life as far as I was concerned, he said. I went to school, I wasn't the least bit uh, aware of the fact that uh, I was in any way different from the others. It's true that I had this title of prince, but it's surprising how uh, you can live it down. But in 1930, aged nine, normal family life ended. Philip's mother, Alice, suffered a nervous breakdown. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and committed to a sanatorium in Switzerland. Prince Philip and his sisters were all taken out for the day, leaving their mother. While they were away, the doorbell rang. These men arrived and uh, they tried to take her willingly and she wouldn't go, so she was basically injected with a um, sedative and then bundled into the car and driven south to Lake Constance, where she was um, put in this sort of secure asylum. Initially, Philip was able to visit his mother, but as she was moved between different institutions, he lost contact with her. She completely vanished from his life. Um, between the ages of sort of 10 and 15. And meanwhile, Prince Philip's father went off to live on the French Riviera with his mistress. Prince Philip's sisters were all more or less grown up by that stage, and they were soon married to German princes. So Prince Philip was really the one who was the main victim of all this. Between 1930 and 1931, all four of Philip's sisters married German aristocrats and moved to Germany. I mean, I think the father figured in, was very intermittent and then went, and his mother um, struggled at that stage. It was a nomadic lifestyle, which must have been really quite difficult, um, because he was that much younger uh, than his sisters. So it was almost as if it was just a part of the baggage that went along with the moves. 
So he had uh, friends elsewhere. I, I, funnily enough, I've met them since, where he, uh, when he went to prep school and places, you know, that he, who took him in, in the holidays. Because he had nowhere else to go, literally. In 1933, Philip went to Germany to stay with his sister Theodora and her husband, Berthold. Berthold's father had established an elite school with the pioneering educationalist Kurt Hahn. In the same year, Adolf Hitler and the Nazis took power and opened the first concentration camp at Dachau. Kurt Hahn was Jewish and had publicly criticized the Nazis. He was imprisoned and only released when the British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald personally intervened. Hahn fled to the UK, where he founded a new school in the north of Scotland, Gordonston and Philip was to be one of the first pupils, sent there in 1934 as the situation in Germany deteriorated. Kurt Hahn's ideas were modern and progressive for their time. He saw a need in society for education to develop the character of young people. The common view was that uh, during puberty, during adolescence, Movements become sluggish and awkward. Coordination of physical and mental efforts is lost. And uh, altogether, there's a dimness in puberty, a malaise, uh, which has been accepted uh, almost as a dogma. Hahn's educational ethos emphasized fitness, expeditions, manual skills, and public service using the nearby hills and rivers as additional classrooms. The aim was to build teamwork and train both the mind and body. Seamanship was one of the main parts of the curriculum, and Hahn said, my best schoolmaster is the Murray Firth. Prince Philip once wrote about his sailing lessons at Gordonston. He said, I was wet, cold, miserable, probably sick, often scared stiff, but I would not have changed the experience for anything. In any case, he said, the discomfort was far outweighed by the moments of intense happiness and excitement. In 1937, Kurt Hahn had to break some terrible news to Philip. His sister, Cecile, and her family had been killed in a plane crash. He did not break down, noted Hahn. His sorrow was that of a man. Aged 16, he returned to Nazi Germany for the funeral, walking behind Cecile's coffin with the husbands of his surviving sisters, one of whom was now a prominent SS officer. Back at Gordonston, Philip rose to become guardian or head boy. He'd had an unsettled childhood, only seeing his parents very rarely after the age of nine. But at Gordonston, he grew up and enjoyed his time there. The headmaster, Kurt Hahn, writes about the pupil he just calls Philip. When Philip came to Gordonston, he says, his marked trait was his undefeatable spirit. His laughter was heard everywhere. But he also comments in here about Prince Philip's character. At times, he wrote, he gave way to intolerance and impatience. He got into a fair number of scrapes through recklessness and wildness. But he notes this, he was often naughty, never nasty. That's probably why um, Gordonston had such an impact. That, I suppose, was the, his, his bit of good luck, uh, was to be involved with Kurt Hahn at that stage in his life. He was a very remarkable individual. After Gordonston, Philip had to move on again. He was virtually a refugee at that stage because he had no real permanent home. But his extended family in the shape of um, Lord Batten was really important. 
Louis Mountbatten was Philip's uncle. Mountbatten's father, Ludwig von Battenberg, had been first sea lord, in charge of the Royal Navy at the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. But he was forced to resign from the post because he was German. In 1917, anti-German feeling was so strong in Britain that the royal family changed their surname from saxe coburg gotha to Windsor. At the same time, the Battenbergs anglicised their name to Mount Batten. When Battenberg was forced to resign as, as first sea lord, this was a great disappointment to him and something of a humiliation, really, for, for, for his family. His youngest son, Louis Mountbatten, was 14 at the time and a naval cadet, and he vowed that he would restore the family honour, the family glory. From 1937 onwards, Mountbatten became a surrogate father to Philip. Louis Mountbatten steered Prince Philip away from what had been his uh, ambition, which was to join the RAF, and he steered him towards the Battenbergs with the great naval tradition. I contemplated going to the Air Force, and uh, I might easily have done, but I think that it so happened that it, there were family reasons and connections that made it, in a sense, easier to get into the Navy. In May 1939, 18-year-old Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark enrolled as a cadet at the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. Two months later, Mountbatten arranged for King George VI and his family to visit the college. He invited his nephew onto the royal yacht, the V&A, to socialise with the young princesses, Margaret and Elizabeth. Philip accompanied us and dined on board, said Mountbatten in his diary, of that day on the River Dart. The following day, he wrote, Philip came back aboard the V&A for tea and was a great success with the children. Mountbatten also arranged for him to look after the princesses on shore. Louis Mountbatten was absolutely instrumental in making sure that the young princesses, in particular Princess Elizabeth, spent time with his 18-year-old handsome nephew. Marion Crawford, known as Crawfee, was governess to Elizabeth, then nicknamed Lilibet by her family. She wrote an account of the impression Philip had made here at Dartmouth. A fair-haired boy, rather like a Viking, with a sharp face and piercing blue eyes. He was good-looking, she said, though rather off-hand in his manner. He said, let's go to the tennis courts and have some real fun jumping the net. Crawfee continued. I thought he showed off a good deal, but the little girls were much impressed. Lilibet said, how good he is, Crawfee. How high he can jump. She never took her eyes off him the entire time. But Elizabeth would not be able to see Philip again for some time. Because five weeks later, Britain was at war. Philip was eager to get straight into action. But it wasn't that simple. As a Greek national, the Royal Navy regarded Philip as a neutral foreigner, so he was not permitted to serve in action. The most they would give him was a job on a convoy ship. But in October 1940, all that changed. When Italy invaded Greece, the Greeks joined the Allies, and there was no longer anything to hold Philip back. He joined the Mediterranean fleet and was soon in action. Philip wrote of a special atmosphere of anticipation of something dramatic when the British fleet set out to sea on the night of the 27th of March, 1941. The British were hunting Italian ships under cover of darkness. Philip, then a 19-year-old midshipman, was in charge of the searchlight on board the battleship HMS Valiant. Unable to see the enemy at night, the Valiant used a radio direction finder which located an echo from an Italian ship. 
Philip quickly pointed his searchlight towards the Echo and turned it on. The Valiant's gunners opened fire. Prince Philip has written about his time as a midshipman during that battle. He said, at this point, all hell broke loose as all our eight 15-inch guns plus those of the flagship started firing at the stationary cruiser, which disappeared, he wrote, in an explosion and a cloud of smoke. Philip was mentioned in dispatches and rose through the ranks. In July 1943, the Allies invaded Sicily. Out at sea, broadside after broadside was fired at the coastal batteries. 22-year-old Philip was now a first lieutenant on the destroyer HMS Wallace. On a night patrol, he hoped the darkness would provide protection from enemy attack. But a German plane spotted the ship's wake and dropped a bomb, causing damage. Having completed one bombing run, the plane circled for another attack. The crew of the Wallace realised their ship was vulnerable and that they were all in danger of losing their lives. But the first lieutenant came up with a cunning plan. Philip used a distraction tactic. He got the crew to quickly build a makeshift raft and set fire to it. In the darkness, as it drifted away, the Germans thought the smoke and flames were coming from the ship they'd just hit and bombed the decoy instead. The Prince and HMS Wallace sailed away to safety. At sea and at war, Philip couldn't see his mother, who was now living in Greece, his sisters in Germany, or his father, who was living in Monte Carlo with his mistress. In December 1944, he received a message about his father from his uncle Mountbatten. So shocked and grieved to hear of the death of your father and send you all my heartfelt sympathy. Following has been received from your mother embrace you tenderly in joint sorrow. After the war, he visited Monte Carlo to pick up his father's effects. Alongside debts of 17,500 pounds, they included a gold signet ring, which he wore from that day on. Louis Mountbatten, who was known to friends and family as Dickie, continued to fill the void left by Philip's father, as the prince himself remarked. I don't think anybody thinks I had a father, Philip said. Most people think that Dickie's my father anyway. Mountbatten also encouraged Philip's relationship with Elizabeth. The princess had come of age during the war and trained as a driver and mechanic. When the war was over, Philip was able to see Elizabeth regularly. Philip was keen on Elizabeth, but didn't always welcome his uncle's interest. He wrote to him in September 1945. Please, I beg you, not too much advice in an affair of the heart, or I shall be forced to do the wooing by proxy. During the summer of 1946, Philip stayed with the royal family at Balmoral, it was here he asked King George VI for his daughter's hand in marriage. How that went down with the king and queen, I think initially they were rather alarmed, really. They felt they didn't want to lose their daughter so quickly. They were a tight-knit family. Added to that, the queen would have preferred someone more from a background similar to her, so English, straight British, aristocracy, not this foreign prince. His uncle, Louis Mountbatten, was regarded quite suspiciously at court because of his sort of progressive stroke left-wing views. And he was seen as 
someone who might use his, his nephew as a sort of kind of Trojan horse via which he would sort of influence the monarchy. The king agreed to the engagement on condition that it be delayed until Elizabeth was 21 years old. However, at the wedding of Mountbatten's daughter, the engagement was officially announced on the 9th of July, 1947. Getting married to a princess wasn't going to be straightforward. Philip had to give up being a prince of Greece and Denmark, convert from Greek Orthodox to the Church of England, and become a British citizen. He also had to choose a new surname. He'd inherited the Danish Schleswig Holstein Sonderburg Glücksburg from his father, but decided to adopt the name from his mother's side and so became Philip Mountbatten. The night before the wedding, Philip celebrated with his uncle at his side. On the 20th of November, 1947, the couple married at Westminster Abbey. The ceremony was broadcast to more than 200 million people around the world. His mother, Alice, had made a recovery and attended the wedding. But his sisters, who married German princes, some of whom fought against Britain in World War II, were not invited. The king bestowed the style Royal Highness on Philip and gave him the title the Duke of Edinburgh. Hemmed in by well-wishers, the royal car had great difficulty in getting back to Broadland, the honeymoon retreat of the royal family. After the honeymoon, Philip continued his naval career. In 1948, they had their first child. Prince Charles. The crowd of press close up to the palace railings, and every now and again a cheer goes up, and the crowd starts to chant, We want Philip. The crowd stood and sang, For he's a jolly good fellow. And all the crowd want to know is that the prince has arrived. Two years later, Anne was born. With the presence of her great grandmother, Queen Mary, there were four generations of the House of Windsor at the young princess's christening party. Philip was posted to Malta, where the couple were able to enjoy a relatively normal married life. He was promoted. Crowds lined the streets to cheer on the young queen and her consort. Three quarters of the population of Australia were estimated to have seen them. As the new head of the Commonwealth, the Queen aimed to visit as much of it as possible. To do that would require a special means of transport. I name the ship Britannia. I wish success to her and to all who sail in her. Britannia was a project that Philip threw himself into. He was passionate about the ship and had worked on the layout of reception rooms, bedrooms and his own office, complete with a scale model of his sole naval command, HMS Magpie. After having helped to design parts of Britannia, including his study here, the Duke of Edinburgh wanted to put the ship to good use. In 1956, he set sail in her without the Queen and he took Britannia to the remotest parts of the Commonwealth, the Falklands, Ascension, Christmas Island, even Antarctica. For the former Navy man, it was a real adventure, traveling to parts of the Commonwealth that could only be reached by sea, including British bases in Antarctica. It meant spending four months, including Christmas, away from his family but in her Christmas message, the Queen talked about the importance of her husband's mission on Britannia. One idea, above all others, has been the mainspring of this journey. It is the wish to foster and advance 
concord and understanding within the Commonwealth. This was the longest solo tour Philip undertook as the Queen's consort, and by the end of it, he'd personally visited more parts of the Commonwealth than any other member of the royal family. The day after he returned, he was rewarded with a new title. He was now officially Prince Philip. He'd also awakened what would become a lifelong interest in science, nature and other cultures. The numerous artefacts on board Britannia demonstrate the fellowship and diversity of the Commonwealth. They include this ceremonial pig killer given by the people of Vanuatu, where some tribes people worship Philip as a god. I'm glad to say it doesn't look as if it's been used recently. Philip also wanted his Britannia expeditions to be educational, as he showed in a children's television program he presented. I've got here a film which shows you some of the dances in New Guinea, which I think will amuse you. The faces of the people are covered in bright colours, in uh, yellow and splendid, um, um, with splendid feathers on top. And here they go. Those feathers are birds of paradise feathers. And they're very colourful. As you can see, he's been doing that for quite a long time. This dance went on for about two days. Imagine they must have quite a stiff neck after that. Now, the, one or two things for many like British that, children, well. this was the first opportunity yeah, they yeah. had to see the diversity of cultures that made up the Commonwealth. <laughs> Philip really embraced the new medium of television. In 1957, presenting a science documentary, The Restless Sphere. Radio engineers aim their transmissions in such a way that it bounces off this ionized layer back to the receiving station, rather like a, a billiard ball bounces off a cushion into a pocket. He's been able to keep pace with the, so, the, the kind of technological changes which have had such an impact. Not only has he kept pace with them, but he's also had the imagination to see where they might go and how they might impact. In the 1960s, Prime Minister Harold Wilson had spoken about modernising Britain with the white heat of new technology. The picture of the Duke at the controls of his helicopter as it rises from the stadium seems to symbolise this age of technological progress and development. Philip was in tune with the times. At heart, he was a moderniser. He wanted to encourage new thinking in the monarchy and in British science and technology. He showed this in 1961, when he became the first royal ever to give a television interview. He was calling for better training to create a skilled workforce for the modern age. I think that so much of our industry is traditional in its, uh, the way it's grown up, that you need a kind of jolt to, to, to make it realize that there is a change in, in, the, in the general pattern of industry. We can't hope to go on competing if we make use only of, of unskilled labor. We've, we've got to make the best use of the skill and the brains of the people, and we know perfectly well that, that the people in this country have got a, a, a remarkable talent for things if they learn how to do them. We ought to make the best use of that. If you have that kind of level of interest in how things worked, I mean, you're always looking to try and make things better, and he kind of understood that the engineering and the technology were very much part of what was going to happen in the future, and getting the right skills in place in order to take advantage of it, absolutely key. Philip was also the first royal to give press conferences and take direct questions from journalists. In Ottawa in 1969, he gave his views on the monarchy in Canada and elsewhere. I think that uh, it's a complete misconception to, to imagine that the monarchy exists for the <laughs> in the interests of the monarch. It doesn't. It, in, it exists in the interests of the people. If at any stage uh, people feel that the, that it has no further part to play, and if it uh, then, for goodness sake, let's end the thing on amicable terms without having a, a row about it, that's all. 
I don't think the structure in terms of the support to the monarchy kind of designed to deal with a consort. So uh, nobody had really thought about, and by the way, what is, what is he going to do? What is your job in your own mind? <laughs> well, I haven't got one. I'm self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that I'm, I may have a position or whatever influence I have or whatever, uh, yes, whatever influence I have, I, I want to use for the benefit of the country. Therefore, I feel that I, I ought to be doing my best for the community. This is really the, in, in, in whatever way I can. Philip did help communities by becoming involved with 800 different charities and organisations beginning with the National Playing Fields Association. What do you boys want? We want to see a boss. Well, I'm afraid he's very busy. He's very important. We want to see the boss. Please tell me, Steve. What do you want to see me about? Because you want to play, Phil. Well, you've come to the right place. It was suggested I should take on a, some sort of charity. And uh, my uncle, uh, Lord Mountbatten, persuaded me to he, he did, followed my father-in-law as president of the National Playing Fields Association, and he suggested I should take that on. And in 1956, he launched the scheme which bears his name to this day, the Duke of Edinburgh's Award. To give young people a chance to discover their own abilities for themselves as an introduction to the responsibilities and interests of the grown-up world, and incidentally, to make new friends and have a great deal of fun and satisfaction in the process. It was created to give young people aged between 14 and 18 a sense of responsibility to themselves and their communities. Nobody in the scheme competes against anybody but themselves. It's a measure of personal endeavor as they go from bronze to silver to the gold award. Inspired by Kurt Hahn's educational ideas that Philip had benefited from at Gordonston, the scheme encouraged young people to be physically active and to give their time to public service. Now, under guidance from Swansea University scientists, eager volunteers are transforming the landscape. Now, a new green light is taking root. But that was Kurt Hahn. I mean, that was really about Kurt Hahn developing his, his concept that about developing individuals and that at your academic qualifications and, your, and the basic skills you, you learn are part of that development. But you have to learn to be a, a, a broader person as well. And that's continued. I'd go so far as to say that a great proportion of the lads who get themselves into trouble with the police uh, could, could, could become our best citizens if they could find an outlet for their enterprise in something rather more useful than crime, then fix their loyalty on something more worthwhile than the gang. The award was a great success, with more than six million youngsters taking part in over 140 countries. But Philip didn't just want the public to feel the royal family had a purpose, he wanted them to see it too. John Braybourne was a film producer and the son-in-law of Louis Mountbatten. In 1968, he approached Philip to ask if he could make a documentary about the royal family. Cameras had never been given fly-on-the-wall access to the royals before, but Philip chaired the committee to consider the idea and supported it. He persuaded the Queen to let the cameras in. On the 21st of June, 1969, people turning on their televisions saw behind the scenes at the palace as the royals talked candidly for the cameras in a way that had never been seen before. Philip saw the film as a way to present the royal family as a family. Oh, it on there? And himself as a normal father cooking sausages on a barbecue. I don't think it was his idea. Uh, I think he thought it was worth trying. I don't know that he'd ever really enjoyed the concept of making um, films and, and being involved in the media with, with that much in, enjoyment. We've got a better device. Yeah. 
It was a... Uh, an interesting experiment. Philip's aim was for the public to get used to the royal family as a regular part of society. I think people have got more accustomed to us. They take us much more naturally. There was used, used to be much more uh, intense interest. Now people take it, to, you know, as a, as a matter of course. They know who we are. They've got to know us, and, and they say, "Oh well, either they can't stand us or they think we're all right." 350 million people watched worldwide, and asked about it many years later. He had no regrets. We don't belong to a secret society. I mean, I can see why people shouldn't know what's going on. Much better that they should know than speculate. As humans have got this power of, of life and death, not, not just life and death, but extinction and survival of other species of life, then we ought to exercise it with, with some sort of moral sense. I mean, w why make something extinct if we don't have to? Or even if we have to, why should we? I don't think we ought to. I think he also had a good broad sense of the, the stresses and strains that were being placed on nature and environment, maybe a bit earlier than some. In 1968, Philip's mother, Alice, came to live in Buckingham Palace. The following year, aged 84, she died. She had written a farewell note to her son. Dearest Philip, be brave and remember I will never leave you and you will always find me when you need me most. All my devoted love, your old mama. Her last request was that she be buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. This was a very hard thing to arrange, but Philip managed to ensure that Alice's coffin was flown there and interred in an Orthodox church. During World War II, at great personal risk, Alice hid a Jewish family in her flat in Nazi-occupied Greece. As a result, Israel posthumously conferred its highest award on her. In 1993, Philip travelled to Jerusalem to accept the award on her behalf. She was a person with a deep religious faith, and she would have considered it to be perfectly natural human reaction to fellow beings in distress. His uncle, Louis Mountbatten, was a friend and mentor, and a man who'd acted very much as a father figure while his own parents were absent. In 1974, the Queen and Prince Philip invited him for a cruise on the Britannia. After that cruise, Mountbatten wrote about his time here on board Britannia. He said, what moved me most of all was the increasing kindness of Lilibet and Philip, who treat me more and more as a really intimate member of their immediate family. And on his return, Mountbatten wrote to Philip. You sometimes seem rather disappointed, perhaps frustrated would be a better word. But I feel you underestimate your effect on the UK and especially the Commonwealth. I hear more and more praise and appreciation from people in all walks of life. In the summer of 1979, Lord Mountbatten was on holiday in Ireland. As he took a small boat out for a day's fishing, the IRA detonated a bomb, killing the 79-year-old and three other passengers. There are always victims, always people who suffer. It doesn't matter how strong your ideals are or whether you're right or wrong, somebody's going to suffer from that if that's the way you choose to do business. And it, it certainly brought that home to a lot more people in that sense because there were two very distinct families who, who suffered as a result of that. Despite the loss of his uncle, Prince Philip went to Ireland years later to speak for mutual understanding. It would be ridiculous to pretend that there haven't been problems, in a sense, between the North and the South. And I think that any initiative which can somehow overcome these uh, rather artificial divisions is, 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 can only be good. 
In 2012, the Queen and Prince Philip both shook the hand of Sinn Féin's Martin McGuinness, a former IRA commander. This was seen as a profound symbol of peace and reconciliation in Northern Ireland. The Duke maintained an active working life, but he was still a father and family man. When the marriage of Prince Charles and Diana was in trouble, Philip tried to help. Diana kept her distance, and so Philip wrote letters to her. I will always do my utmost to help you and Charles to the best of my ability. But I'm quite ready to concede that I have no talents as a marriage counsellor. To which Diana replied, You are very modest about your marriage guidance skills, and I disagree with you. This last letter of yours shows great understanding and tact, and I hope to be able to draw on your advice. With my fondest love, Diana. His own upbringing, uh, his own instability in terms of his young life, had given him an extraordinary perspective, uh, an ability to relate, and an, an, a, an inbuilt strength. But if you, if you want to have a discussion about something which is really close to you, you know that he will listen, because that is and what he does. And he does it very well. And he's a really good listener. And I suspect that that's part of the, um, maybe his experience, his own experience. There wasn't really anybody to listen. So he understands that value. In August 1997, Princess Diana was killed in a car crash in Paris. The royal family were at Balmoral. The Duke and the Queen protected their grandsons, William and Harry, from press intrusion by keeping them at Balmoral for five days before returning to London, where they supported the boys when they came to see the flowers and meet the crowds outside Kensington Palace. At the funeral, William was not sure that he would be able to walk behind his mother's coffin. It was a question of, if you'll do it, I'll do it. And that was him as a grandfather saying, if that's what you want to do, and if you want me to be there, I will be there. Philip stayed by William's side throughout the walk and supported him. A few months later, the Queen and the Duke celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, and the Queen took the opportunity to praise her husband. All too often, I fear Prince Philip has had to listen to me speaking. Frequently, we have discussed my intended speech beforehand, and as you will imagine, his views have been expressed in a forthright manner. <laughs> He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. From the very outset, I think he was extremely valuable as the foil for his wife. This monarch who is indisputably you know, the finest monarch that this country has ever had. Without Prince Philip, at her side and, and, and supporting her as this confidence-giving consort. There's no way she would have been able to reign in the way that she did. He grew into the role. He was his own man. That always makes me laugh when you read in the newspapers that people would have been prepared for this. I don't think so. <laughs> it didn't happen. There aren't courses in um, X, Y and Z within family, but you get introduced to things, you get taken to things, like being an apprentice. It's part of the uh, your build-up of your life experiences. There is no um, manual uh, in that respect. Father, consort, innovator, grandfather. In Prince Philip's royal life, he has left his own indelible mark.
car and driven south to Lake Constance, where she was um, put in this sort of secure asylum. Initially, Philip was able to visit his mother. But as she was moved between different institutions, he lost contact with her. She completely vanished from his life um, between the ages of sort of 10 and 15. And meanwhile, Prince Philip's father went off to live on the French Riviera with his mistress. Prince Philip's sisters were all more or less grown up by that stage, and they were soon married to German princes. So Prince Philip was really the one who was the main victim of all this. Between 1930 and 1931, all four of Philip's sisters married German aristocrats and moved to Germany. I mean, I think the father figure was very intermittent and then went, and his mother um, struggled at that stage. It was a nomadic lifestyle, which must have been really quite difficult, um, because he was that much younger uh, than his sisters. So it was almost as if it was just a part of the baggage that went along with the moves. So he had uh, friends elsewhere. I, I, funny enough, I've met them since, where he, and when he went to prep school and places, you know, that he, it, who took him in, in the holidays, because he had nowhere else to go, literally. In 1933, Philip went to Germany to stay with his sister, Thea 